Decades of Israeli occupation have left Palestinians struggling to access clean water. Israel controls a majority of the freshwater resources in the occupied West Bank. And in Gaza, a 16-year blockade and military operations have had a devastating impact on the water supply. Rising temperatures and sea levels are only making life more difficult. While in Israel, residents don't have to worry about taps running dry. People in Power examines this growing disparity. to happen. Israel had to respond. Israel had to launch this preemptive strike. Daily raids, daily demolitions. The conflict is again reaching a boiling point. Power is running low and my water is running low. Once again, it's the Palestinian people who pay the price. Water is life, especially in one of the most water scarce regions in the world. In Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, millions of people live next to the sea. But you can't use seawater for drinking, washing or agriculture. Monitoring groups say Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories have a water deficit. They use much more water every year than can be replenished naturally. As temperatures rise and droughts are drawn out, water sources are drying up. Whoever controls the water controls the people. Israel can remedy all the problems, but this is a part of a political decision not to do so. Israel is a water superpower, and Israeli authorities have the power to turn on and turn off the taps in the occupied Palestinian territories. <laughs> We're like sitting on a Titanic ship. Everyone is going to hit the iceberg. We're traveling to the Erez crossing, the entry point from Israel into Gaza. From here, it's a kilometre-long walk from the checkpoint to the place many call the world's biggest open-air prison. Here, more than two million Gazans live at the water's edge. But according to monitoring groups, around 97% of natural water supplies are undrinkable. Faced with a tainted public water supply, private enterprise has stepped in to fill the gap. These trucks are seen all over Gaza. They fill up at an unregulated private company that takes dirty water and cleans it up. Then they drive around town, delivering it to customers. This water, uh, most of the time, was a subject of uh, suspicious uh, hygienity but it was the only uh, available resource for, for people at their homes to, to drink and to cook their water. We're riding along with water distributor Mohammed Ahmed as he delivers water to residents at the Shati refugee camp in Gaza City. <laughs> The 
Every home that can afford it has a water tank on top of their building. The water delivery man attaches his hose, then pumps the water into the tank with a petrol generator. But it comes at a cost. Surveys have found that many Gazans spend 33% of their annual income on clean water. For some residents of the Shati camp, a water tank is an unaffordable luxury. Mohammed usually fills up their container free of charge. He's been delivering water to Gazans for 18 years, one of the lucky ones with a steady job. But he tells us he can barely put food on the table for his four children. Gaza's water crisis is not new. It's been going on for years. A generation of Gazan children have grown up without adequate access to water, and they're at increased risk from waterborne diseases, such as diarrhea, and hepatitis. Rights groups and the UN have estimated that about a quarter of all disease in Gaza is caused by water contamination. Uh, because of the unique situation of Gaza and the blockades and the way it's situated, uh, there is, I think, there's always a problem with water and water and san sanitation. Kidney problems like skin problems, uh, some maybe cancer problems. Well, I think there's a crisis, a political crisis. First, of course, there's the, the, the blockade occupation. That's the real crisis. Gaza's only supply of fresh water is the underground coastal aquifer. An aquifer is like an underground sponge that soaks up groundwater, which then resurfaces through springs and wells. But Gaza's only aquifer has been badly damaged. Raw sewage seeping into the water supply, high levels of nitrates and rising sea levels have left the fresh water unusable. Seawater uh, has uh, been coming and intruding to the uh, aquifer. Most of uh, the water wells in the uh, western part of the city is getting very saline and uh, cannot be used for drinking or any other domestic use as well. The aquifer has been damaged because of overpumping and seawater intrusion and pollution from untreated sewage. So there's high level of, of salt, high level of nitrates. You can basically have a shower in Gaza as if you are taking a dip in the sea. Around a fifth of Gaza's untreated sewage ends up in the coastal aquifer. This river, a little way down the coast from the beach, pumps raw sewage into the sea when the water treatment plant isn't working due to frequent power cuts. Gazan authorities and rights groups say Israel has destroyed key water infrastructure during its bombing campaigns. The uh, infrastructure is too old and uh, it's being hit uh, several times during escalations. Every year we have one or two escalations. In May 2021, we have direct uh, hitting and uh, damaging the infrastructure, uh, causing a lot of problems to water, and this hasn't been repaired properly yet. This man has one of the most important jobs on the Gaza Strip. He decides which neighborhoods get water and which don't. مهم جدا في عملية التوزيع انه احنا بنحاول نوصل المية للمواطنين بالتوازي مع الكهرباء. Gaza can only provide a fraction of the water its residents need. So by spinning these wheels, he opens and closes the pipes and tries to divert the supply to where it's needed most. 
Nearby, this laboratory is taking samples of Gaza's water supply to test for purity, but the results make for grim reading. The salinity and nitrate levels in the water are well above the WHO safety limit. According to WHO, the salinity in the water should not be more than 500 milligrams per liter, while today in our water, TDS is, uh, is more than, uh, in some areas, 5,000, 6,000 uh, milligrams per liter. Authorities here say they're doing the best they can to supply water to as many households as possible. At the moment, you can get water from the tap here for a few hours a day, but it's mixed with seawater to boost supply. Faced with a water crisis, international donors and governments have stepped in. Today, we've been invited to the inauguration of Gaza's new desalination plant, which will take salt water from the sea and convert it into water that's safe to drink and wash in. This impressive-looking plant is supposed to supply water to 250,000 Gaza residents. All the movers and shakers of the international development community are here for the opening. Every child has the right to access safe drinking water. It's a fundamental right. The Gaza Strip is one of the most populated areas in the world, and 96% of the water from the aquifer is not for human consumption. That's why it's so important to desalinate the water from the sea and produce an alternative source of water. But access to the Gaza Strip is not easy. The blockade means construction projects like this are slow coming. This plant is opening seven years behind schedule. This project, it's only two years construction yani in terms of design, uh, tendering and construction. But because of uh, uh, the delay on bringing materials into Gaza by the Israeli side and, and giving a long time of security clearance, this project uh, witnessed uh, uh, such, such uh, years of delays. The Israeli blockade means projects such as this are beset by delays and difficulties, mainly because it's almost impossible to import dual-use materials into Gaza, materials that the Israelis say could be used for military purposes. Yeah, it wasn't easy. I mean, as you know, in May we experienced a flare-up of violence. Every other year or so, and even more regularly, unfortunately, we have military escalations. And that, of course, stops, to a large extent, any kind of activity, including the import of much needed equipment from Israel. The Israeli Authority responsible for security in Gaza declined to be interviewed for this program. But they said in a statement, most of these projects involve the entry of dual-purpose goods, pipes, dangerous materials, advanced technology, and more, which pose great complications because the terror organizations, Hamas foremost among them, cynically exploit the entry of such materials for the purpose of advancing terrorism against the state of Israel. I've been speaking to a lot of Palestinians on this story, and they all say the same thing. They need the international community to put pressure on Israel to end the blockade and to improve their lives. They want you to do more. Why aren't you doing more? First of all, we are doing a lot. But of course, as you rightly pointed out, the solution has to be political. It's not sufficient for us to address climate change. It's not sufficient to us to ease the restrictions from Israel. We need to have the end of the occupation. We need so many things. We need pressure on the international community, not just the EU, the US, the Gulf and engagement. Financing needs are huge. We're talking of billions and billions of dollars and euros. Why? Israel was able to satisfy its water needs by desalinating the water for the entire population. They have an excess water. We can do the same thing here in Gaza, but it needs far more political space to do that. The buzzword for Israelis is security. Imagine two million people deprived of water, deprived of travel, deprived of uh, economic um, growth, uh, deprived of any prospects. Uh, what do you expect of people who are living under an open-air prison? Does this reflect uh, on Israeli security? The water situation in Gaza is already dire, but there's an even bigger threat on the horizon. 
a warming planet is changing weather patterns all over the world, especially here. This hotel on the shores of the Dead Sea used to attract tourists from around the world. These days, it's a wasteland. The place was a vivid place. Uh, it used to host uh, Arabs from all nations, uh, 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 Europeans, uh, everyone here used to come and sit right there to sip their coffee by the uh, Dead Sea because the water was literally at this edge that you can see here. Since the 1950s, the freshwater sources that feed into the Dead Sea have been diverted for drinking water and irrigation and the waterline has receded dramatically. This once seaside resort has now found itself almost half a kilometre away from the disappearing sea. We're like sitting on a Titanic ship. There's people who are on the uh, first class luxury uh, space, sipping champagne in the ballrooms. But once the iceberg hit the Titanic, Everybody sinks. Israel could have the best technology in the world for desalination and for wastewater treatment, but when it comes to having a thirsty neighbor, it's all gonna hit the iceberg. Everyone is going to hit the iceberg. We're traveling to the Jordan Valley here, water is a shared resource in a divided land. In the 1990s, Israeli and Palestinian leaders signed the Oslo Accords, which recognized the Palestinians' right to water and promised them greater access to water resources. But the water infrastructure is almost entirely controlled by Israel. Suher's family has farmed in the Jordan Valley for generations. She says that now the town's water resources are being taken by Israeli authorities. من المواطن الفلسطيني لسحبها لري مزروعات المستوطن الإسرائيلي صدقا صدقا شعور مؤلم جدا لما مجرد النظر من شباك السيارة وانت قد تقطع هالمسافات تتطلع على كمية الأراضي اللي تسحبها المستوطنات كل يوم لما أنا ابن البلد العوجة يتم منعي من الوقوف على هذه الأرض Israeli settlements in the occupied Palestinian territories are considered illegal under international law. But in 2023, Israel's government said it would approve thousands of new settler homes in the occupied West Bank. But it's not just the Israeli state that's limiting Palestinian access to water. Emboldened Israeli settlers are taking matters into their own hands. Farmers in Ein Samia, a natural spring near Ramallah, say incursions by settlers, some of them armed, are happening almost daily. The frequent incursions by illegal Israeli settlers have sent shockwaves through this small community. Farmers say they're being forced to abandon their lands and their spring. Without water, they can no longer farm here. Inside you can see here. This is the damage. 
you destroy everything. You know? Why? Why would? Why would people do this? Because they have the power. They have the power. We have cannot. We haven't anything to defend ourselves. Ourselves. They can do it without punishment. This is the reason. A local farmer shows me the damage from the latest raid. He says the settlers punctured their water tanks with knives, destroyed crops, and stole their irrigation systems. Uh, the people who work here are poor farmers. They work too hard to feed their cells and their families. And suddenly we uh, are attacked by settlers. This land is controlled by the Palestinian Authority, but they say they're powerless to stop the attacks on the water infrastructure. We've spoken to many farmers in Palestine and they feel that nobody is protecting them. Isn't it your job to protect them? Solomon's Pools in the occupied West Bank. This was once the main water source for Jerusalem. For farmers who live here, illegal settlements are a troubling presence on the horizon. شعور إنسان غريب جاي ماخذ أرضك ومبني فيها وقاعد فيها شو راح يكون شعورك؟ أنا بعيد السؤال إلك أنت عندك أرض وأجي أنا أخذها منك وأبني فيها وأقعد وأنت ممنوع تصل الأرض تبعتك هاي وتستخدمها ممنوع تبني فيها شو شعورك أنت كإنسان موجود على هاي الأرض؟ Fadi says this community has been decimated by a lack of access to water and competition from subsidized Israeli products. Today, with dwindling access to water, many Palestinian farmers here have abandoned their land and gone to work as day laborers in Israel. Israel's government told us in a statement, in accordance with the international agreements, responsibility for supplying water to the Palestinian residents throughout Judea and Samaria lies with the Palestinian Authority. There is no policy of preventing water from reaching the Palestinians. The conflict between Israel and Palestine is often portrayed as a conflict where both sides are to blame. But there's no equivalence when it comes to access to water. The facts speak for themselves. Israel controls more than 80% of all water resources in the occupied West Bank. And any Israeli doesn't experience any water shortage. I can open my water tap and can come back a week later and I still have water. But no Palestinians can even imagine such a situation. 100% of Israelis have access to daily running water, compared with just 36% of Palestinians. The new illegal settlements promised in the occupied West Bank by Israel's government, if built, would drain yet more Palestinian water resources. It is important for us to, to act today. It's a matter of survival. We are over-abstracting the aquifers to replenish the demands of today, but we're not drinking the water of our grandchildren. We're drinking the water of our own children. As temperatures rise and water becomes even more scarce, both Israel and Palestine will face existential challenges that go far beyond border disputes. The only solution is cooperation and compromise. Neither will be easy to achieve. But if nothing is done, the Palestinian people could lose access to their most vital lifeline.